Do you like dance punk music? Not daft punk, dance punk. Daft punk is playing in my house, my house. A subgenre of music that blends punk's raw energy with the rhythmic and danceable beats of funk and disco. It's punk rock with some groove to it. Take me out! The reason I bring it up is because what we call dance punk is experiencing a resurgence in the post-punk scene and beyond. Viagra Boys recently put their own manic twist on the genre with their album Cave World. Last year's Struggler had Genesis Owusu deliver the sound with a more uplifting funk feel. Newcomer's model actress debuted with one of the genre's noisiest renditions in Dog's Body. And if singles are anything to go by, the two most highly anticipated punk albums for early 2024 are sounding heavy on the dance punk influence. Of course, this isn't the first time we've seen the genre make something of a comeback. Genres come in and out of season all the time, but it seems to be happening exactly every 20 years for dance punk. So why are the punks dancing now? And what makes this time different? Well, for the first time, multiple dance punk generations are coexisting at once. You have this current post-punk progression coming out of the UK, the revival that grew out of 2000s indie rock that's still going strong, and you even have bands from the genre's initial 80s post-punk wave still making music to this day. But to understand exactly how this happened and what dance punk even is, we have to go back to where it all began. And that's with the death of disco. With the release of Saturday Night Fever, disco had become the most popular genre in the US, and punk fans absolutely hated it. They saw disco as manufactured, repetitive, and overproduced garbage. Punk music was a reaction against disco and other popular sounds of the era, calling for a more raw and authentic form of musical expression. Of course, punk had always technically been great music to dance to. Just look at any Ramon song. Oh, By the late 1970s, a post-punk era was arriving. Both disco and punk had reached a point where they'd become restrictive, and so there was a strong desire to break musical boundaries and challenge the norm. And what's more anti-punk than embracing the very thing the genre hated? This was the dawn of dance punk, born from the ashes of disco and the raw energy of punk. Post-punk wanted to innovate, and one of the very bands that kicked off the punk movement in the UK just years prior would be a key band in defining what dance punk would sound like. When the Sex Pistols broke up, the band's frontman John Lydon immediately formed Public Image, an experimental rock outfit whose first two albums were heavily influenced by dub reggae. Public Image's sonic experiments gave birth to early dance punk cuts like Death Disco, Fodder Stomp, and Albatross. But it's Gang of Four's debut album, Entertainment, that is seen as the foundational album in the dance punk genre. With a focus on rhythm, this is punk music that carries the dance floor foundations of funk, dance, reggae, and dub elements. The bass lines are funky, the percussion steady, and the riffs jagged and angular. And it was this fusion of dance beats and punk's rawness that set the album apart in 1979. The band's lyrics also touched on issues like consumerism, free will, and alienation, solidifying the album's place in post-punk history. No from society. Kurt Cobain has listed it among his favorite 50 albums, Flea of the Red Hot Chili Peppers credits it with significantly influencing his bass playing, and it's noted for inspiring later bands like Block Party, Franz Ferdinand, and The Rapture. Entertainment marked a departure from both the fluidity of dance genres and the rigidity of punk, and cemented itself as one of the most influential albums of the 70s. Now, during these next formative years, post-punk was like a shotgun blast of rock music, a scattered bunch of subgenres across a spectrum of sound. Plenty of these artists would go on to inspire future post-punk and dance-punk generations, but it's a smaller cluster of artists that could be considered dance-punk pioneers. 
who are challenging genre boundaries and racial barriers in music. Frequently overlapping with dance punk, new wave band Talking Heads were heavily criticized for their fusion of Afrobeat influences on their 1980 album Remain in Light. Anchored by their rhythm section, Liquid Liquid's primitive punk borrowed the percussive elements of African and Latin music. When three sisters from the Bronx formed ESG, their minimalist funk music not only left an impression on the post-punk world, but the hip-hop scene as well, becoming one of the most sampled artists in the genre. It appears that for a brief moment, the punks had decided they wanted to dance. But by 1984, the dance punk movement was already in steep decline. Dance music and punk music began going their separate ways again. Post-punk was still fairly rhythmic, but it was becoming more emotional, darker, and immersive in sound. Artists who were initially part of the movement disappeared or began evolving their sound, the clubs and labels that supported the scene either closed or ceased operations completely, and by the 1990s, trends were shifting towards grunge, indie rock, Britpop, and hip-hop. You could hear the spirit of dance punk in bands like The Stone Roses, Primal Scream, and Happy Mondays, but for the most part, dance music wasn't being embraced within indie circles. We want to be free. By the end of the 90s, there was a sense that everything in rock music had already been done. So ironically, artists began remixing and reinterpreting past styles and genres in an attempt to make something new. This would lead to the post-punk revival of the early 2000s and the dance punk explosion that was right behind it. As artists began drawing from influences of the past, subgenres new and old began to emerge including dance punk. But the way I look at it, there was dance punk before House of Jealous Lovers and dance punk after House of Jealous Lovers. Before that single, bands in New York like La Tigre, Liars, and Radio 4 were already revitalizing the raw, danceable punk sound pioneered by Gang of Four, Public Image, ESG, Liquid Liquid, and Talking Heads. It was dance punk as we knew it. No attention. And then The Rapture dropped House of Jealous Lovers in March 2002. Often credited with revitalizing and redefining the dance punk genre, the track's production style would become influential moving forward. It featured live drums, techno hi-hats, hand claps, jagged guitars, raw vocals, and a good amount of cowbell. It was rock-based dance music featuring a repetitive groove that complements a party atmosphere. Lyrics didn't matter nearly as much as feeling. It was the most dance floor ready rendition of dance punk yet, because the dance floor is where the track was born. You see, the rapture had arrived in New York sounding like this. Not long after, the band's frontman Luke Jenner met the DFA, a production duo famed for pairing the live drums of post-punk tracks with their own synthesized disco rhythms. Jenner initially avoided working with the DFA because he thought the rapture would be alienating their fans if they ever started making dance tracks. But Jenner later agreed to have the DFA produce House of Jealous Lovers to tap into the city's club scene. Jenner and his label initially hated the DFA's mix, but soon the track exploded and became the DFA's best-selling single. Its success and critical acclaim brought attention to not only the rapture, but also put the style of dance punk into the limelight, disco punk records that could be played in a club. The rapture quickly changed their tune and worked with the DFA to produce what would become their debut album, Echoes. <laughs> you may not know is that one half of the DFA was James Murphy, the former indie punk and self-taught sound engineer who would go on to form LCD's sound system, the pioneers of modern dance punk. Producing the Rapture's House of Jealous Lovers was just the catalyst for everything the DFA were about to do next. The DFA had grown a reputation for mixing music from across the dance and rock spectrum from Can to Liquid Liquid and ESG, and that made their set combinations unique, until Murphy started hearing other DJs playing similar music. 
That fear of being overtaken by younger and new DJs inspired the track Losing My Edge, a dance punk single about an aging DJ desperately trying to maintain his relevance in a constantly evolving scene. I'm losing my edge to the kids from France. LCD Sound System's debut single pretty much sums up the collective in a very meta way. It became an anthem for the indie music know-it-alls, while also reinterpreting 1980s post-punk into electronic dance music. The project's debut album in 2005 showcased more of Murphy's unique style and blending of nostalgic influences, remixing the past into something entirely new and yet strangely familiar. Finding these easter eggs and references within the band's music became a part of the appeal. The band's second album, Sound of Silver, is considered a masterpiece in the genre, breaking free from the punk and indie rock mold, embracing the synth punk and kraut rock sounds of artists like Suicide, Can, and Kraftwerk. LCD Sound System's dance punk became known for its rhythmic and repetitive disco beats, but also for mixing the introspective with the energetic. Murphy's lyrics could be a quirky blend of sarcasm and irony, but also brutally honest and heartfelt, delivering stories, emotions, and confessions like no one else in the scene. By 2010, LCD Sound System had cemented their place as a cornerstone of modern dance punk, expanding the scope of the genre itself. When most music nerds think of dance punk, they likely think of LCD Sound System. And when their third album, This Is Happening, was announced as their last, it wasn't just the end of an era for the band. It was a turning point for the genre. But we'll come back to that, because it wasn't just LCD Sound System reshaping the dance punk world in the mid-2000s. If not for being completely overshadowed by LCD Sound System, and for having one of the least search engine friendly band names ever, Check 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 would perhaps be one of the more notable bands of the era. With plenty of funky bass lines over dense beats, their dance punk style recalled the sounds of Talking Heads, Kraftwerk, and Gang of Four. They too found success in the New York club scene thanks to their dance punk epic Me and Giuliani Down by the Schoolyard, a 10 minute single that would help make their second album a dance punk classic. Up here in Canada, though, we were keeping dance punk hardcore with Death From Above. Their debut, You're a Woman, I'm a Machine, is an essential record in the genre, emphasizing just how wide the boundaries of dance punk had become. The duo have created some of the most primal and raw dance punk, using mainly a bass guitar and drums. It was heavy groove rock with disco beats. Inspired by the funk of Rick James and the electro of Daft Punk, Death From Above seemed poised to take the scene by storm. But shortly after the album's release, the band broke up, leaving us without any new material for nearly a decade. By the mid-2000s, the British began invading the post-punk revival. Glasgow-based band Franz Ferdinand took home the Mercury Prize after they set out to make guitar records that girls could dance to. Block Party emerged from East London with a colder and more introspective sound, but also focused heavily on their rhythm section. both with their own definitive anthems, signaled a shift in the indie rock genre, adding a danceable quality that was still somewhat unique at the time, and would be influential to future artists. But hold on, wh what even is dance punk anymore? Because this is called dance punk, but then so is this, and these too? I could go on all day about what defines a dance punk track and who merits inclusion in the conversation, but in truth, it comes down to personal opinion. 
the genre became a spectrum of a post-punk approach that features restless and repetitive rhythms. It's dancey and there's a punk edge. That's it. Those are the parameters. There are those that are more dance than punk, more punk than dance, albums that generally represent the sound, and those that are approaching the outskirts of the genre but are still within the spectrum of dance punk. It gets even more complicated when genres like New Rave begin building on dance punk foundations, becoming an all-encompassing label for bands like Klaxons and Late of the Pier, who were fusing together a number of rock and dance styles. At this point, tracing influences becomes difficult. Everything became a revival of a revival, as bands just wanted to be one of the strokes. As indie music generally got more rhythmic and electronic, the lines between genres and influences blurred further still. After reaching its commercial peak and radio saturation in the mid-2000s, the post-punk revival was quickly flattening out and merging into mainstream indie rock by the end of the decade. Artists like Radiohead, Modest Mouse, The Strokes, Arcade Fire, Interpol, The White Stripes, and Queens of the Stone Age all existed under the same umbrella as a band like Foles. An indie rock outfit from Oxford, England, known for their creative blend of math rock and dance punk, who recorded their debut album in Brooklyn, New York, with a member of art rock band TV on the radio in the producer's chair. Their high guitar tuning and staccato playing create that sharp, angular sound that is a hallmark of math rock. Driving beats and a rhythmic intensity contribute to the album's danceable punk energy, and the incorporation of a Brooklyn-based Afrobeat band adds a layer of indie rock experimentation. But two years after Antidotes, Foles would shift towards a more lush and atmospheric indie rock sound. Indie music generally got pretty chill. Bands had in fact sold their guitars and bought turntables, because Everything became Indie-tronica. At once, post-punk sounded like this. But also like this. With the revival fading, a generation of post-punk bands were about to go back to an experimental approach, featuring the raw sounds of the original post-punk wave of the 80s. It was time to say goodbye to post-punk as we knew it, but I was there. In February 2011, LCD Sound System announced they would be playing their last show at Madison Square Garden, and it was a big deal. It was a four-hour performance, chronicled by a documentary, and eventually turned into a live album. It definitely felt like an end to the dance punk era. So what happened to dance punk after LCD Sound System left? The Rapture, Check Check Check, and Franz Ferdinand would still produce records within the realm of dance punk, but many bands either changed their musical direction, took breaks, or disbanded, leading to a perceived end of the genre. Dance punk didn't entirely disappear, it just became easier to sort this sound and sounds like it by one general term, modern or indie rock. Even James Murphy didn't veer too far from the spotlight, ensuring all of indie had turned dance when he produced Arcade Fire's Reflector in 2013. Death From Above 1979 revived the band and released their highly anticipated follow-up after a 10-year break. And by the following year, LCD Sound System were already reuniting for a summer festival circuit. Less than five years after what was a highly publicized farewell, LCD Sound System's comeback was met with a mix of excitement and skepticism. But their fourth album, American Dream, proved to be a successful return for dance punk's modern icons. It's much better than it used to be. But this entire era was quickly becoming dad rock. During LCD Sound System's short goodbye, yet another post-punk scene was thriving. Throughout the 2010s, bands like Ice Age, Preoccupations, and Proto Martyr were emphasizing a more raw and experimental sound, another revival of early 1980s post-punk, but certainly a more authentic revival. Coming full circle, post-punk would stay fairly rhythmic, but become more emotional, darker, and immersive in sound, emphasizing the gothic aspects of post-punk's golden era. <laughs> This new post-punk revival, or crank wave as it's been called, has expanded into this massive web within the current indie era. British guitar music is so hot right now, and it's more of a post-punk progression, where artists and listeners have come to expect something new with each new project. 
these post-Brexit bands are known for their self-awareness, irony, and genre experimentation. Growing up with the greatest access to music than any generation before them. Towards the end of the 2010s, some of these post-punk bands would begin embracing a more rhythmic sound, cowbell included. When New York's Parquet Courts decided to work with producer Danger Mouse on their sixth album, Wide Awake, they'd create a record indebted to both punk and funk. Comparisons could be made to Gang of Four, The Fall, and Talking Heads, and their following album, Sympathy for Life, is even more dance-oriented than anything they'd done before. The band didn't feel like making another rock record, and since getting more into dance and techno, Parquet Courts now aims to make the kind of music that connects people on the dance floor. Where the 2000s wave turned dance punk more dance, this modern wave is the most punk the genre has ever been, as well as more sarcastic, more anxious, and manic than ever before. A punk band formed in Stockholm, Sweden, Viagra Boys burst onto the scene with their energetic and satirical style in Streetworms. Known for their dark humor and social commentary delivered with a deadpan growl, the band's sound is a blend of traditional punk, post-punk, new wave, and maybe even a bit of country influence. It's relatively simple and rhythm-based punk. But where their second album, Welfare Jazz, saw them expand and experiment with their original sound, it's their third album, Cave World, that sees Viagra Boys at their peak. Inspired by techno and hip-hop, and with influences ranging from Devo to Motorhead, the band forge a primal dance punk sound to go with their wild reflections on the pandemic and modern society. We're putting microchips in the vaccines. Little creepy crawlers with tiny little legs that creep around your body. Post-punk and dance-punk have always been movements that reflect societal issues, challenge norms, and provoke thoughts on the complex world we live in. With every generation, the music is a medium that artists use to express their concerns about society. The rise of neoliberal policies, the impact of technology on our lives, and the ongoing struggle for authenticity in a commercialized world. So in an era where information is as splintered as the subgenres of post-punk, how do we sift through the noise to understand the issues at play? This is where our sponsor Ground News comes into the picture. Ground News is not your average news platform. It's designed to help us navigate the overwhelming sea of information with tools that cut through bias and present news in a way that's easy to digest and understand. You see, with Ground News, you can track how different media outlets cover the same story, seeing firsthand how perspective and bias can shape a narrative. So much post-punk music tends to lean left in their politics. And even if you might agree with what they're saying, it's important to understand both sides of an argument. Ground News has a blind spot feature that reveals stories that might be overlooked or ignored by one side of the political spectrum. So if you lean right, you may have missed this story. And if you lean left, you might have missed this one. Ground News has become my favorite way to consume news because I'm getting a more honest representation of that news. And it's made me a better informed human. You can go to ground.news slash middle and get 40% off unlimited access to their app, website, and newsletters. So check out ground.news slash middle or click the link in the description to start your journey to a clearer understanding of the news. Now, never fight a man with a perm. Throughout their evolution, idols have maintained a core identity of intense, politically charged music with a raw and energetic style. But since about 2021, they've been leaning into more rhythmic territory, working with hip hop producer Kenny Beats on their fourth album, performing an incredible cover of Gang of Four's Damaged Goods, and collaborating with LCD Sound System on the punk funk single Dancer for their 2024 album Tank. Vocalist Joe Talbot also went into the new record wanting to make people dance, representing a significant step in the band's artistic journey. But if you ask me, it's Yard Act who are definitely ones to watch. Minimalist disco grooves, angular riffs, and the sarcastic deadpan delivery are all here. 
nothing game-changing, but they sound just as indebted to the 2000s dance punk revival as much as they do to the formative 80s era of the genre. With a spoken word delivery reminiscent of a hip-hop project like The Streets, vocalist James Smith does a lot of the heavy lifting on the project acting as part comedian and part activist, being almost unbearably clever with his one-liners and social commentary at times. It's a writing style Smith credits to Alex Turner of the Arctic Monkeys, but delivered with a similar energy to that of LCD's sound system. And so you wanted a head. Well, this is how we do hits. During their Reddit AMA, someone asked Yardact what they thought about music genres in general. And they said that people need context to understand things initially, but then things transcend that context when it's no longer relevant. Since more post-punk has been fitting into that frame of dance punk lately, dance punk appears more relevant. Every time the genre has declined, the genre doesn't just disappear. It's just no longer as relevant and we call it by a different name. These dance punk sounds come in waves typically after a more gothic, emotional, and atmospheric era of post-punk. Because that's just what post-punk does. It has always been a mirror to our ever-shifting moods and societal tides, always pushing the envelope, never choosing to settle. It's supposed to be something new every time. Lately, it sounds like dance punk. Whatever that is anymore. 